Amen. Amen. All right. There was a little boy who wanted $100 really badly. And as little boys do, they try to find all kinds of creative ways to get their money. So he decided that he would appeal to the highest authority he knew. He would write a letter to God and ask God for $100. And of course, when the post office received this letter addressed to God at USA, they thought it was pretty cute. And so they wanted to make sure that the little boy got a reply. So they uh, sent the letter to the highest authority that they knew, which was the President of the United States. And of course, when the White House received that letter, the Secretary thought it was pretty cute and showed it to the President, who again was amused, and decided to send the little boy a $5 bill. So the little boy got the letter back in the mail, he was super excited, of course, and opened it up and a little disappointed to see there was only a $5 bill inside. But not to be ungrateful, he wrote a thank you letter back to God. He said, God, I wanted to thank you so much for the $5 that you sent me. But I want you to know that uh, for some reason, your letter went through Washington, D.C. And as usual, those jerks took $95 of it. So <laughs> pretty fitting on this uh, occasion where we're at with our government, right? If you got your notes, it's on the top. We're also going to put a verse up on the screen. It's Luke 2, 52. I would like all of us in this room to read this verse together nice and loud. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men. If you're guests, we're been in this series called Fitness. We've talked about how spiritual fitness is always in motion. If there was ever someone who had arrived and who thought, I got it together, I don't need to grow anymore, we think it would be Jesus. But those two words, Jesus grew, you might want to circle those in your notes because if Jesus grew, we need to do that as well. We need to continue to grow, whether this is your first time following Christ or you've been a follower of Christ for 50 years, we need to make sure fitness is always in motion. I would encourage you, if you've missed a couple weeks, to go back to our website, yankton.church. You can watch all of our messages. You can also go to our YouTube channel, Celebrate Yankton, and catch up on that. The first week we talked about having a heart like Jesus, developing the heart like Jesus. We must care about the things that Jesus cared about. But even more importantly, we talked about we must not care about the things Jesus didn't care about. And we looked at this passage where two men came to Jesus in Luke 9, and they wanted to follow Jesus. They were willing to do that. But they made this statement to Jesus. They said, Lord, first let me. And we unpacked the fact that how if we say Jesus is Lord, we can't say to them, first let me. If he's our Lord, we need to surrender to him and submit to him. And last week, uh, Pastor Dave was down here from Sioux Falls, and man, he did a fantastic job talking about relationships and how we can be spiritually healthy in our relationships and how it takes consistency, it takes commitment, and it takes character. And if you missed it last week, man, you missed out on something amazing. And Pastor Lisa, who was, was our service pastor last week, she's one of our Celebrate Yankton uh, church members here, and she was here hosting while Pastor Dave was preaching. And after he got done preaching, she came up and she shared something that I thought was absolutely incredible. And again, if you missed it, I would encourage you to watch that. If you follow us on Facebook, we put her little one minute video of what she said out on Facebook. It was the most watched video in the history of our church. It has more views than any other video. And I think it's really in that one minute, I think she most clearly communicated the heart and the vision of what we're trying to do here at Celebrate. So if you missed that, do yourself a favor and go back and do that. So this week, as promised throughout this series, we are going to be talking about money and what it means to be spiritually healthy with our money. And I've been joking, I haven't announced what week this is gonna be, so hopefully you didn't avoid it. So if you got trapped, gotcha. Um, so the number one cause of divorce in our country today is money. The number one most divisive topic in any business is money. Fathers and children, mothers and children, brothers and sisters have literally been torn apart because of arguments that have developed over family finances. And I don't even need to get started on how much our government, their argument with the money. We are in a, the longest shutdown in the history of our country. And again, whatever side of the aisle you're on, I'm not here to argue that. I'm here about unity, not division. But the, the point is, how do we spend the money? And that's what the fight is about. So it's no wonder the number one most divisive topic in the church is money. And so whenever we talk about money, people get very sensitive. And I just want to tell you, if you're here today, I love you, okay? And if anything that is said here today offends you, please know, I want to have a conversation about it. We're not here to put anybody on the defense. We're not here to make anybody feel. We're just here to preach God's truth and what God says about money. Because Jesus talked about money a lot. Did you know that of all the parables that Jesus told, 
one out of every 10 had to do with money. Now, I think that's significant. We'll come back to that in a second. But the reason why Jesus talked about money so much, and because Jesus talked about money so much, we as a church are going to talk about money. But I think he did it because he knew how divisive it can be. He knew that it's the number one competitor for your heart is money. So we are going to talk about money. And just like we said last week, a lot of times with our money, it's Lord, first let me. God, I, I don't get enough. Lord, first let me do what I need to do first. And then if there's anything left over, God, I'll give that to you. And again, we'll come back to that in a second. But before we get into this, if you got your notes, I want you to go ahead and flip them over. Because... As Celebrate Yankton, we're still a kind of a baby church. And if you're a guest, I kind of want to walk you through how we view money here at Celebrate Yankton. And if you've been here before, you've heard this before, but it's always good to review. And so this is not stuff that I've made up because I'm not that good. This is God's word. This is what God's word said. And me as your pastor, 41 years of life, how I'm doing that and how we deal with money here at Celebrate Yankton. And I just want to be open about that. The first word I want you to write down is the word responsibility. We are responsible for what God gives us. We believe that 100% of what God gives us comes from God, and we need to be responsible for that. So I need you to know, as a church, we believe in what's called an open budget. This is what I mean by that. Whether this is your very first time here or you're a member, if you want to sit down with us and you want to see every single place that we spend, every single dime for this church, that is open to you. We will set up, set up an appointment to do that right on your connection card. People have actually taken me up on this, by the way, and I, I admire that. That is open to you. There are two things, and you might want to write these down. There's two things that are off limits that you won't be able to see. And there's very good reason for that. Number one is you will never be able to see what an individual gives. So you can't go to Bruce and say, I want to see what Bruce gives, and I'm going to look at you. That's, that's not open to you, because that's not your business. That's between Bruce and God. And the other thing I'll add to that is I don't even know what you guys give. I, as your pastor, have put a guardrail in my life where I don't know the amount that people give. And because my heart is wicked. And if I find out somebody's given this amount, somebody's given this amount, I could sit here and say, oh, I won't treat them any differently. I don't know that that's true. And so I put that protection in place. Now, I'll add to that, I do know who gives, okay? So I get a list of names of people who have given because I wanna pray for you and I wanna thank you. Does that make sense? So I don't know. Here's the second thing that, that'll be off limits. You won't know what an individual gives. You won't know what a staff, a paid staff salary is. Okay, now right now that's just me, okay? And I always say this, if you're dying to know, I will tell you what it is, okay? But the reason why we don't do that, because we're gonna grow, we're gonna add staff, we're eventually, we're gonna add a children's pastor. That's the first paid position we're gonna add to this church. And we're not gonna post that for everybody to see. The reason for that is it doesn't matter what the amount is, there will be those who think, well, that's not enough, or why are we paying them that much, okay? So that's why we don't post that. But that comes to the second word. So the first word is responsible, the second word is accountability. Because you say, okay, pastor, then who's watching that? Okay, who's taking care of that? Who's seeing that? We have a leadership team here that's part of our Celebrate Yankton Church. That's our leadership team. They go through the budget with me, and our calendar year, just so you know for the church, goes from May 1st to April 30th. I don't know why. Don't ask that question. <laughs> that's just what the church does. It goes May 1st to April 30th. So we're, we've been we're living on a budget from May 1st through April 30th. And coming up very quickly, we're going to be looking at the next year and what that looks like as well. As many of you know, we're part of a parent church called Celebrate Church in Sioux Falls, and they have been walking with us as well. Before we launched, um, they were with us as well. And since May 1st of this year, everything that has been given here in Yankton has stayed here in Yankton. It's been part of our budget. So again, if you want to see that, that's available. No one, and I just want to make sure that I make this very clear. No one in Sioux Falls sits up there and says, I think you guys should spend your money this way. That doesn't happen. I know that there's a, a kind of a rumor going around about that. That's a myth. If you hear that, please stop that right away. Because here's the thing. We get the autonomy to decide what we do. Now, because I've never planted a church before, okay, and I've never been a pastor before, I ask a lot of questions, okay? And Sioux Falls has been very good at walking with us and helping us understand those things. They make great suggestion, great advice while we do that. But that's where we're at. So we have responsibility. We have accountability. Because, again, we're ultimately accountable to God. Whatever you return to God here at the church, you're not paying me. You're not even paying the church. You're not paying Celebrate. You're giving it to God. And I have to give an account as the pastor of this church for every dime that comes into this church. And I don't do that for you. I do that because I'm going to stand before God one day, and I take that very seriously. Does that make sense? So here's the third thing, and this is where we're going to land today. It's the word you want to write down called tithing. If that's a new word for you, I want to help you with what tithing means. 
tithing is one tenth. And again, this isn't my opinion. This is what God's word said. God said, I give you everything. Everything you have comes from me. And so I take whatever you give and take the first one tenth of whatever I give you and you return it to God. We don't give God anything. We return it to God. One tenth. So if I have ten dollars, okay, what is a tithe on ten dollars? One dollar. Okay, you guys are great. It's going to get harder. Hold on. If I have a hundred dollars, what is a tithe on a hundred dollars? You guys are awesome. Should we go one more? If I have a thousand dollars, all right, what is a tithe on a thousand dollars? Wow. See, it gets a little harder as they get bigger, right? Okay. That's what we believe. And again, this is what God's word says. Now, I want everybody to look right here because this is super important. You can come to this church for the rest of your life and not put a dime in the plate. And I will not love you any differently. Because you know I won't know what you give, right? Okay? Please hear that. It's got nothing to do with money. It's got everything to do with trust. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, some of you hear that and you say, oh, great. I don't have to give to God ever anything. That's not what I said. <laughs> Please don't hear that. Okay? This is what we want to live out your God designed purpose. This is what God has called us to do. And we want to make sure that we're doing what God said. And we want to be spiritually fit. So with that, today we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to watch a video by a pastor by the name of Dr. Robert Morris. I don't know if you know who that is or not, but he is the lead pastor and founding pastor of Gateway Church in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And the reason why we're watching the video is because this is the most anointed message I have ever heard on the topic of tithing. And I don't think I could communicate it any better than Robert Morris did. The second reason we're going to watch this is because Robert Morris has what I call experiential authority. What do I mean by that? If I were to have cancer, okay, and I survive cancer, I would be able to speak up, stand up here, and I would be able to speak on what cancer does and being a cancer survivor. Does that make sense? Okay, Robert Morris and his wife felt a calling by God to give away everything God had given them. Checking, savings, 401k, both their cars and their house, sold everything and gave it to God as an offering. And they've done that twice. I've never done that before, okay? So when this guy talks, I sit up and listen. Now, I tell you that because I know we've all heard the pastors, right, who get on TV and say, God tells me I need a brand new airplane, so you need to give me, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? So when you hear this, and I know that's the filter many of us use when we hear pastors talk about money, I want you to know this is not that guy, okay? And, and I think that this is just an anointed message. So we're going to go ahead and watch that, and then when we're done, we're going to come back and we're going to do something pretty cool. So go ahead and watch. This is the principle of the first Robert Morris. I don't know where that message lands for you, but I want to just share one thing with you. Um, the average American Christian, the average church-going person who would say, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, returns to God 4% of their income. And we look at our church today and we wonder why we're struggling. And I want you to know that, you know, when, in church planning 101, if you want to call it that, when you build a budget for a church, you base the number on the number of people you come, the number of people you come, you have this number, and then you, you go from there. And I won't bore you with the details of that. When I planted this church, when God called me to yanked it, he's very clear with me. He said, you know what? He said, Jeff, I want, do you believe in this? With my family, we've been tithing. We've, we've committed to that. We've believed in this principle. He said, Jeff, do you believe in that? I said, absolutely. He said, will you preach it when you go down there? I said, absolutely, I will. And whenever you hear messages on money or whatever, sometimes there's a thought that, like, oh, the church needs money, and we're not. We're, we're, not, we're fine. Um, as a church, we're, we're doing actually really good for the size we are. But the reason why it is is because there's people in the church who get this, who understand this. And, and if you're sitting here right now and you're feeling defensive, um, I want to invite my friend Bob Millage to come up here. Um, I've asked Bob to come up here, and he's going to be sharing with you a little bit. And, and because, again, I could sit up here and I could say this and I could communicate it, or, or I could show you what God's done just in the time that since we've been here. So you guys welcome Bob to the stage for me. I just, just take a moment, just share with us kind of your journey, how you got to celebrate, and the principle of first that you shared. First thing I need to make sure that everybody knows is that I'm not perfect at this. Act. But I think it's about the faith thing. You know, it, it, I at least have a heart about it now instead of just, uh, yeah, I'll get it next time. But we started coming to celebrate on your kickoff. Um, 
that was a real answer to prayer. We originally came to celebrate because my daughter-in-law did not have a church home. Um, we were going to a church that we enjoyed a lot, but um, it was a little, it was bigger for her. So therefore we felt as a family that we needed to support her. And it was a really good decision for us. But to get back to what the topic is that we're talking about is last fall, when we were going through the, I believe the success series, uh, tithing comes up. I've always known to give, I was raised that way. Um, I didn't know why I was giving, you just gave a church. Right? But I, I had been through many, many different financial uh, programs. I, I've seen that this year, and they're, they're really good with the Ramsey program to get it. But, and I knew that, but I always forgot that very first step of that 10%. Because in my mind, if I take 10% away from this, there wasn't enough to go with the other 90%. So I always did exactly what he talked about. I'm gonna pay all this and then it's okay to give. I actually had a financial advisor tell me one time, God understands that. So I went through years of really, um, I believe that she felt that way because she was an accountant. But the reality was is that I, my accountant said no, that was the first percent, or first to put 10%. So, I went home after that, 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 that series, and I thought, okay, we're, we make money to meet our needs. We've, we've done okay in life and everything, but it's always on my mind. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously getting older. <laughs> I wanted to know about what's going to happen in the end. You know, my family has play. I mean, I went through all those things, and finally I thought, no, I need to figure out what's going on today. Uh, we like to give. Anybody that knows my wife, would give away everything if I didn't tie her up every now and then. But she, that's the way she is. So I knew that giving wasn't going to be a problem. But I didn't feel convicted. I felt convicted for Bob about that. So I made the decision. I spent some time and did some researching and thinking. Because there's a lot of uh, teachings out there right now that will say this type is still for today. Uh, it is. And um, ironically, one of the, one of the uh, one of the research when it pulled up was, was Dr. Morris, and I thought, oh my gosh, she makes that so reality. So, and the other part was I read several times in scripture where God says, test me on this, and I thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, yeah. so. So talk about that, Let, let's go from September till today. Okay. Talk about what, how, how, what have you seen, what's the difference, man? Okay, again, I wanna emphasize that I have, I have jumped in and out um, but I ha I'm convicted now, so I know that that's right. Um, there's a whole long story with this, and I won't get into it, but the first um, really obvious sign to us was we were selling our home, and we had a number in our head that we had to have. It wasn't that we were selling our home because we couldn't afford it. It was the fact that I just we really felt it to convicted to become debt-free, which we had for years, but we've never taken the whole step. So we put our house on the market. We thought we had this great house that we wanted, which, like I said, I won't get into that story, but that house would not sell. And our home in the area that we live, they were selling very, very quickly as we got on the market. It would not sell until we left that offer go on the other home. And at the time I was thinking, oh great, now what are we gonna do, you know, we got this. So anyway, it was okay. Anyway, um, an offer came in on the house, and it came in, and it was not the number that we needed. We, we have this in our mind, and remember, we're not selling the house because we have to, we're selling it for a goal. And I said to Beth, we can't take this. This, this does not meet our goal. So we made a counter offer. Um, and the realtor said to us, this gal is a cash buyer, and she's not gonna negotiate with you. She's gonna come there, she's gonna lay the money on the table, and she's gonna walk away. And I thought, okay, then we're not gonna sell, because this is the number. She came back with a counter offer that, when I first heard it, I thought, oh, that's not a good deal for me. But when I wrote down the numbers, she came back with a cash offer up front, and then she gave us four months to live in the home with no rent or mortgage, and she would close that day. When you add those numbers up, it came to our number. So that's, it took me a couple of days to go, oh, wow, that was probably an answer to prayer. Um, 
a home came along that was not where I thought we were going to live, but it, it, it fits our budget, and when I'm in that house now, I know it's the right place. So I know that was the first thing, but um, I think the thing that I really want to share is that I figured out that you don't give to get. You know, if, if I mean, that's, that's an investment. That's what you do with the 90% that's left over that God has given us to be good stewards of. There's a big difference between that. That 10% shouldn't even be in your, I mean, it's just not in there. And I figured that out. I work in, a, in an organization that talks about stewardship all the time. And when I stopped and thought about what does that mean? Well, what it is, it's there, I'm responsible for managing their money. And that's that's kind of where I got with, with I'm managing God's money in that part. So. Somebody's sitting here right now, and they were where you were in September, and they think, okay, what, What's holding me? I, I, I've got some pushback against that. What would you say to somebody who's hesitating right now? And that, go ahead and wrap that up. Well, first of all, I was. I, I think about that. If we have made the decision to follow Christ, we we have accepted. We we obviously the spirit has moved in our heart enough to know that there must be something there, or we wouldn't have moved in that direction. And I think that in my, my opinion is, is that when you choose to follow Christ, you follow him through <clears throat> all of his teachings. The, the scriptures, you don't get to pick and choose which ones work for you. And um, I think a lot of us do that in life. But there are certain things in my life that I know we don't do as a Christian, and, and we're, we are very firm in that. But finances are kind of a personal, quiet little thing. Nobody really knows um, where this stuff is, but, but God knows. So when you choose to be a Christian, you choose to take all of those, that whole thing. Um, my other thing is that I would say to somebody is if you're not sure, first of all, God says to test him on it. I mean, and, and he keeps his promises, we know that. And then I would say, I did all of the other way because I knew best, I'll pay all these bills. And you know, I, I can hear this in my head, so how was that working for you? Okay, um, it got us through but I didn't ever feel complete. And I guess I really want to stress that the tithing is just the obedience. It's, it's, it's all of the peace that comes with it and all that stuff that, um, it's, it's just truly about obedience for everything after that. So I, I would say, what do you have to lose? You know? Give it up for Bob. I'm gonna ask our prayer team to go ahead and come on up here. Um, and I want you to write a date in your notes. The date is July 20th. Go ahead and write that down. And the reason why I'm telling you to write that down is because just what Bob was saying and just what Pastor Robert Moore said, I understand if there's pushback on this. I get it. What we're asking you to do is for the next six months, would you be committed to tithing? Would you be committed to the principle of the first? And if you are willing to do that, Make a declaration of that. Write it on your connection card, email me, text me, whatever. Put our numbers on the screen. We'll make a commitment saying, hey, we're going to do that. Now, I'm not asking you to do that because we're going to chase you down in two weeks from now saying, hey, where's your tithe? That's not what it's about. What I'm saying to you is that for the next six months, if you commit to that, if you say, that's what I'm going to do, we want to pray for you, we want to walk with you, but if it gets to be July 20th and just what Bob said, it's not working for me, I guarantee you, okay, we're not a church that's going to do this very well. We will write you a check and we will give you 100% of that money back. Okay? But you have to be committed. You have to, you have to put it down in writing, commit to it, and we will do that. Because here's the thing. This is why I can stand up here with 100% confidence to say that. It's because God will not fail. Okay? It's got nothing to do with your money. It's got everything to do with your trust. Do you trust God to do that? Let's go ahead and go to prayer. God, you know, you live, Jesus, you walked on this earth, and you understand how just divisive and how, how much money can have a hold of our hearts, God. And so, God, I'm, I'm going to ask right now that, that whatever's going on inside of our hearts, if, if there's of us in this room who have taken this principle seriously, God, and have stepped up to the plate and said, we're going we're gonna to be obedient to that, God. I just pray that they will feel your, your power, your presence, and your anointing. God, if there's someone here who hasn't done that and wants to do that, but maybe they're a little nervous, 
And maybe it is, just as Bob said, maybe it's not about the 10%, maybe it's about the other 90% and, and wondering how we're going to manage that, God. I pray that you would give them wisdom and clarity in what to do with that. God, and if there's anyone here today who is just still feeling that pushback, that resistance, or think there's some kind of other agenda, God, I just pray that you would open their heart to let's continue this conversation. Let's sit down together. Let's talk about it. Let's meet with people. Maybe you meet with Bob. Maybe you meet with somebody else here, God, and walk through that together. Because again, it's got nothing to do with money. It's got everything to do with trust. And Jesus, we're, we're grateful that you've given us everything. Let us be good stewards of that. Let us return to you what belongs to you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.